All right, my lords and ladies, we're going to get started with the educational portion of today's program. Woo, education! Yeah, education! Woohoo! Um, so, we are an educational 501c3 nonprofit organization, and so this is our part that keeps us tax free. Uh, so, it also is intended to help you get a little context of the insanity you're about to witness. Um, so, what we're doing is Commedia dell'arte. It is 16th century comedy, improvised theater. And so this is a kind of theater I fell in love with 16 years ago when I saw it at Penzik. And I learned, oh my gosh, there's some real history behind it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of how Commedia came to be. I'm going to tell you about the um, aspects, the criteria that makes Commedia Commedia and not something else. And I'm going to show you some bits and pieces of, um, of those criteria. <clears throat> and I also have a relatively uh, decent packet of documentation. I have uh, six copies here for anybody who wants to peruse it while we go. So if, you, if there's six people who want to come up and get um, documentation to peruse through that, you're more than welcome to do that um, at any time. I've got six copies, and you're welcome to them. I'll leave them here so you can sneak. And no one has to really, you know, volunteer in front of everybody that says, I like that. So, um, <laughs> sneak in the education. Shh, don't tell So, for those of you who don't know yet, my name is Sophia the Orange, and I love Canadia because it is a theater form like none other. It is quite extreme. It's like, uh, Italian Renaissance cartoons, a lot like Looney Tunes. And we've had a lot, a lot of fun with it here with E Frenzy for the past four years. And so this troop of gangs, uh, this gang of people, this troop, has been together for about four years and put together this play in a very, very special way. This is a period scenario. And it's hard to get that to happen because those period scenarios require at least 11 actors. And those 11 actors have to be trained up in all of the skills that it takes to put on a commedia style play. And they have to work together. And they actually have to like each other. <laughs> so being able to pull all of that together and make all those stars in line is what makes this special today. So uh, where did commedia come from? Well, imagine um, we are in the middle of the 1500s in Italy. And we're seeing this renaissance of art happen. Decades prior, the church pretty much had a stranglehold on all of the theater-like things that you can see. They used uh, theater to tell the Bible stories to people who were very illiterate, mostly in the population. So the church had kind of a stranglehold on it, but that loosened up, and other people started doing secular plays for their own entertainments. And by the time you get to the mid-1500s, you see this thing happening where troops of people, groups, are getting together and doing this style of theater because it not only is entertaining on the side, but you can start making a living doing this. These people became skilled enough and it became popular enough that in the middle, you know, starting kind of 1540, 50, 60, you saw people spending their whole lives just devoted to this activity. It made them enough money they could live on it. They became professionals and they became famous. They became farmed out to foreign courts. The courts of France and Spain hired out these troops and said, I've got the Italian Commedia people, who do you have? Ha. And so it was a piece of um, bragging rights to have the Italian comedians come visit and, um, and perform for you. So it was, it was like having Britney Spears. I mean, you like Britney Spears. So we have this tendency, this trend, of theater happening in the mid 1500s. So, um, what makes it comedian, actual comedian? Well, there's a few things that go into that. First, you you do not have a script like you do with Shakespeare, Molière. All these other people have been writing out lines for decades and centuries. They've been writing out a play that has lines, scenes, exact directions. 
What happened with Comedia is people found ways to improvise. That allowed them more flexibility. That allowed them to bring in more local information from gossip and make the play material apply to the people in the audience much more. So they connected more with the audience. So they became more popular in that town. So they got more people to come to their shows making more money. So it was more profitable to be an improviser instead of producing the same play over and over and over again. It also allowed them to be more flexible as they traveled around the country. So they're in Italy, and that's made up of a bunch of city-states at this point. You've got Napoli, you've got the uh, Roman, uh, you've got the Roman area, and you've got Florence, you've got Venice, and you've got slightly different languages and cultures in all these places, and if a troupe could take a basic story and adapt it, to wherever they went, they could take one play and get more mileage out of it everywhere that they went. And if you were really good, you go and with your troop to this new town, you don't tell anybody you're there yet. You go to the taverns and you get into the community a little bit. You listen for the gossip. You listen to see who was sleeping with who at the party last night. Who's the local celebrities that you can make fun of or support depending on what kind of political brouhaha you want to get into. And you take that gossip from the town, you work it into your play. We'll be doing that a little today. And so this flexibility allowed the troops to take the material that they used and get more mileage out of it and make more money and uh, be more popular uh, with, the, with the communities that they were in. Also, with this traveling, you had language barriers. Because with all these different city states, they had different languages. It wasn't all Italian. You didn't just go and say buongiorno and everybody knows what you say. So the language barrier was overcome with this style of performance in a few different ways. First of all, it was very physical. You had huge physical movements. All of the actors conveyed what they were trying to say through movement, begging the people to say something using your whole body to say, I'm begging you, please don't make me marry the Capitano. That allowed the language to be much less important. So if I'm saying, I need to do costuming and masks. These masks are a big part of what makes Comedia Comedia. So I'm going to describe for you some of the stock characters that you see in these shows all the time. There are some that are core that we see all the time in, in decades and centuries worth of Comedia. So I'll start at the top. At the top we have Pantalone. Pantalone is a nasty old Ebenezer Scrooge-like merchant. He's He's old, he's nasty, he's a man, he's impotent, and he cares for nothing but money, and making money, and holding on to money, and scheming other people out of, their, out of their money. And if he has a daughter, he's going to do nothing but sell her off for money. Oh, Pantalone, I'm so happy to see you. Oh, really, do you know why? Because I found a very rich man, and he's single. Oh, uh, he's gonna marry my daughter! <laughs> what a great idea! Oh, I know, I'm glad I came up with it! Oh, you're brilliant! Oh, you're so brilliant. Well, oh, let, me, let me show the good people your beautiful nose. I want to show this nose. That is a rich man's nose. That nose on his mask, is on his face, is beautiful. Thank you. Is making me blush. Is, is very consistent pantalone. It's this big eagle looking thing, which is noble, beautiful and noble. Absolutely. And your your red dress, being dressed in red with this with this fez like cap and your and your Italian coat, those are all red. 
Yeah, show the leg to the people. <laughs> All of them. Yeah, mom was just so. Um, <laughs> you are the most handsome, rich, nasty miser merchant I've ever known. It's, it comes from a, from a lifestyle of scamming people. <laughs> Pantalona, you're the best. <laughs> Thank you, Pantalona. I'm so glad you got to meet the people because, oh. you know, they love meeting you. I'm sure they will love And I will have to take all the meet these people. This is going to be very. You can fleece them after the show. Ooh. <laughs> I will. <laughs> well done. So, Pantalone is key. He is usually one of the fathers or um, <coughs> heads of household in one of these stories. Now, he has another friend named Dottore Graziano. And we don't have a Dottore Graziano today. Um, but he is often sh shown in the plays. He is an absent-minded professor, know-it-all kind of blowhard kind of guy. And he will have a mask that is like one of these. He will have a mask that's like one of these. He's got a very big nose, and he's got eyebrows, and it leaves the bottom half of his face to be very expressive. So, uh, Del Torre is, his, is Pantalone's neighbor, or friend, or um, enemy, uh, but they, two of them, are often in plays representing two households. Uh, there are often, uh, sometimes, other old men, like in today's play we have a third named Pafano, and that's kind of a creative branch, so you, you know, sometimes you have other people, other characters that come in, but Pantalone is consistent, you always have a Pantalone. And Dottore, often, but not absolutely every time. So, we collectively call these old men the Vecchi. We always have that. Now, in addition to these nasty old men, they have children. These children are the lovers of our story. And the lovers always will be striving to be in love with their, their match, whoever it is. They will be, oh, look! Isabella, she looks so happy. Oh yes, I'm oh. the most wonderful pet you did. Oh, oh where was he? A bit of in the market. His name is Oh, Razio. You got his name this time. Yes. Oh, God. oh well done. Oh, I'm so proud of you. And 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 what else do you know about him? He's handsome. He's handsome. And his name's Arazio. His name's Arazio. And, and I'm in love with him. And you're in love with him. <laughs> and what else? What more is there? Well, of course, that's all you need, right? Just to be in love. That's all you need. And you will be happily ever after. That's all you have to say. So Isabella is one of the female lovers. And there are male lovers as well. Oh, look, there's a male lover right now. He's the most oh, handsome. Oh, hello. Oh. Hello, you handsome, handsome devil. Oh. Oh. It is I, Flavio. Flavio. Oh, Flavio, I, I just think I'm in love with you right now. Let's run off. Let's run off and get married. She's in love with me. Let's just do that. She's in love with me. I am. Oh, you are my sun, my moon, my starlit sky. Without you, I dwell in darkness. Oh, where'd you go? She's, she left me. Oh my God, she left me. Oh, 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 there you are. No. Bad, you don't kiss me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe I can show her. Maybe I can show her. Wow. Until then. Until then. Oh, she will feel. Oh, my heart. My heart will break until then. In which case, then it will be healed. I will heal you. <sighs> That's my hand. <laughs> so. The lovers do not have masks. And you'll notice that was a real woman. <laughs> in Commedia, this was one of the first times you see women on the stage, especially professionally. You'll uh, recall hearing that Shakespeare up in England did not allow women on the stage. They had young men playing the women's parts very often. Not so in Commedia, because guess what? It made money to have a beautiful woman, like the one you just saw, here, in front of everybody maskless, in a beautiful dress, spouting poetry, and, and having drama. That brought in the people to pay the price for admission and maybe
maybe stand there in the audience and you know have their pockets picked by someone you've hired. Any number of ways to get money out of people who have come to see the show. So women being part of this is a big deal, and they played the lovers with no masks at all. You'll also notice with the costuming, the lovers were dressed in um, clothes of noble people of that <coughs> period, whatever it is. Whatever the location and time period was, the lovers would be dressed like that. Uh -huh. Kevin had pretty specific clothing. Del Torre was always dressed as a professional, usually in black. So those are specific things with the lovers uh, clothed in the period, uh, period and uh, locale. So um, now we also have fun with servants. Servants are incredible fun because you've got some that are good and some that are bad and some that are smart, some that are not. And everyone has different motivations. So you can do a lot to forward the plot with different kinds of servants. And again, we have men and women. So there's lots of them here. And oh look, here comes the right All now. All right, Sophie, I've, as Signorina Sophia, I have everything ready. I've taken the forms off to the royal room where they belong. Yes. So I am ready for this show. Excellent. We've got an audience here that's audience. ready to work. Ready. Uh, is yes. there anything else I can do for you right now? Do you need me to hatch a cunning scheme? Oh my gosh, you know, you sound like a servant that's got it all together and you're very positively motivated and, you know, if, if I were your master, I would feel supported and, like, I wouldn't have to beat you or anything. And you sound like a great Angelino. That is my name. Oh, that's awesome. And you don't seem to have a mask on now. That's okay. true. For some reason, Petrolino does not wear a mask. Oh, crazy. What? Well, you've also got a friend over there. That uh, I do seems just trust my mistress. Can I help you? Are you trustworthy? Um, are you oh. ready to help? Yes. 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 Men and women both that we can count on to further the plot in a positive fashion. Aren't you glad Vergella is not in this show? Oh yeah, Vergella would be awful. Oh my god. And oh, I'm really glad that Vergella's not here because you know if he were here, he'd look like that. And that's just mean and nasty, and I would feel threatened by that look. And well, you should. He will stab you in the back for oh. two ducats. Ah! Oh, yes. I would hate that. Or oh, I would really, really hate that. Now, I, you know, I, I, that's fun. I like that. I like having servants around, both positive and, and you know, occasionally you can have a negative one because you got to have a plot in there somewhere. But, you know, it just seems ah, like ah, we're missing ah, something. Ah, 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 oh my gosh! You look like you have a lot of energy, and you're very physical, yep. and you seem very positively motivated. And what else is about you? Well, I'm hungry. You're hungry. I'm hungry. And I like her because she cooks food. <laughs> oh, she does. Francis is a great cook. She's a great cook! Oh, wow. You had a great pose there. Do that again. Oh, my God! You're Arlecchino! Oh, yeah! Look at that! The most famous character to ever come out of Commedia dell'arte is Arlecchino. And who, who gave birth, well, not literally, but um, <laughs> who then was his, yeah, that was the last show we had a pregnant early. <laughs> That's a period piece, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's one of those things. Arlecchino was inspirational to other characters like Harlequin. So the, he, this showed up in other places that ended up in ballet and opera and other forms of theater. The very physical, Servant who is very positively motivated yes. and all over the place, and we love him so much. Now, Arlecchino, and you how many paintings have we seen of that one pose he does? Which pose? Oh, that pose! There's a lot of those. <laughs> so, Arlecchino, we have some things to do. We've got to make sure that all of the props are uh, backstage in the right place and all the food is uh, taken care of, and everybody has their scenarios ready, and all of the costumes are on people, and all of their masks are everything. Uh, can you make sure all that happens? All oh, right, so right. the food goes on people, right. And the props go in the audience in that seat and that seat. And, um, <laughs> can I have this? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Carlo, you know, you are doing just the right thing. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. 
Um, yes! You are doing just right. Um, I tell you what, could you go find your master? My master? My master, master would be great. We need his master. Um, the one with the big nose. Capitano! Oh, the big, do we, anybody with a big nose? Out there, do we have a big nose? Capitano. All right, we may not have a big nose to show off. We can demonstrate the principles, however. Well, we will show the Capitano's mask. Capitano Spavento is one of those extra characters. So we've had the, the Becky and the lovers and the servants. Then there's other kind of wacky characters you throw in for spice and flavor. One of those is Capitano Spavento. Now, the, one of the super famous commedia actors, uh, Antonio Andrani, he, um, he invented this character because he was a prisoner of war. He was a soldier and he was a prisoner of war in Spain. He brought this back and created a character to make fun of the Spanish. Okay. So the Capitano Spavento is a soldier who is a braggart and he believes he is God's gift to women. He is the bravest, most skillful swordsman and don't of Europe, but he is actually a coward. He will run from any fight. He will take any woman, but he will also not actually have your back. He will find a way out of any conflict. And he has this mask with one very obvious aspect to it on purpose. He's making up for something. <laughs> Demone has a corresponding obvious aspect that is also on purpose and has corresponding symbolism. So the pantalone does not have the virility of Capitano. So a pantalone will often have a cod piece that is empty, uh, but not so Capitano. He is our uh, symbol of virility. And so Capitano <coughs> is the one that the women will sometimes fall for and sometimes not. And uh, he is represented by uh, the very obvious uh, symbol on his mask. Um, Oh, and here's another example of another Capitano mask. This one's out of paper mache. So let me talk about the masks for just a second. There's a wonderful book if you're into mask making. This is the gold standard of mask making books. And my very good friend, uh, Drake, from the Barony of Flaming Griffin, which is uh, down <coughs> in Cincinnati in Ohio, he has taken this art of making Commedia masks and he's pushed it as far as anyone has in the SCA. He's taken his leather working skills, which are extraordinary to begin with, and he's applied them to making Commedia masks with this book about how to make masks, and then lots of pictures that we have from a variety of places. This is my favorite book with uh, paintings and portraits and woodcuts um, from pre-1600 that show us what those masks looked like. So again, if you want to see the documentation, sneak to the corner and uh, read up over there. So the masks were a person's face, and the actors themselves would make them, and they would become this character. So each of the actors became a specialist in their own character. That's a little bit different than how we do it here in the SCA. In the SCA, we have to be super flexible because we never know when someone's going to get sick or when someone's going to be caught in a medical facility taking care of a friend in Fairfax, Virginia, and um, you know, counting on somebody else to fill in with 45 minutes worth of prep time. So things happen in the SCA, but back then what happened is a person became a professional in their particular character. So they became a great pantalone, and they would do that for decades, and they would die being a pantalone. You would have a lover, like a, an Isabella, Isabella Andrini is one of the uh, famous Isabellas that the character was named after. And she, she was Isabella into her very late, um, late golden years. So these professionals did this for a living. We do it for a hobby, and so we have a lot of mix and match. So putting it in context for the SCA, everybody here is a regular old SCA person. Nobody here is a trained <laughs> professional uh, theater person. Uh, everybody has a tiny little bit of something they did in theater before I got a hold of them and said, hey, Commedia looks good on you. And so we have a lot of random skills that we have brought together and they train on how to improvise 
And a lot of that is the kinds of things that you might have seen on the TV show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? So those kinds of training games we do to learn how to improvise together. So what you're going to see is the presentation of a story that we improvise. There's no script. And this book shows you those scenarios written by a guy named Flaminio Scala in 1611. It was published in 1611, so we know they did this for decades prior to that. And what you'll see is little scenes and descriptions of what the action is that the actor has to uh, communicate to the audience. Like Pantalone tells his daughter Isabella she has to marry the Capitano, and she runs off upset. That's all you get, and that's if you're lucky. Sometimes there are very confusing things in the period scenarios, and sometimes they're wrong. And sometimes all you get is they play a love scene. That's what you get. And so these actors figure out how to fill in. So what we've done with this particular play, the fake Tufano, we took what was in the 1611 play, and we worked with it a lot. There were a lot of confusing things. There were a lot of things that didn't make sense. There were a lot of bits and pieces where the, uh, where the characters did not uh, have clear motivation, so we filled in the gaps. And in the documentation I have here, you can see our notes from the original to what you are seeing today, and where we filled in those gaps and how we did that, um, and some explanations for all of that. So people need their masks, I guess. So um, that is your very basic, quick, and easy lesson: media and putting it in the context in the SCA. So imagine, if you will, that you are in uh, Rome, and it's 1580. And you've been invited to some very rich person's house for a wonderful party. And let's say somebody's getting married, and they said, oh, we've got the best entertainment for the wedding. We've got these musicians. We're going to have them. Yeah, music is going to be great. And we've got some dancers. Dance is going to be great. We've got the best food. The food is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. And you wouldn't believe it. We got E. Ferenzi. E. Ferenzi is here. They're going to do a show. It's going to be wonderful. We'll all drink and be merry and, and have a wonderful time. And so the experience you're going to have is what it would be like to be in a noble's house where they've hired in a troupe. And we're going to present to you this funny story. And we can all enjoy a bit of period. So, I'm going to take my books. Please do take a look at the documentation that I worked really, really hard on. Wait, wait. <laughs> and, um, so, we're going to take just a minute.